So I want to thank you for coming out today. I'm Brian Leahy. I'm the uh, director of the Cal California Department of Pesticide Regulation. We're very excited to have Bill Griffin, supervising ag standards specialist for the Madera County Department of Agriculture. For eight, the last 18 years, uh, Bill worked as the, an agricultural standards specialist with the Fresno County Department of Agriculture. In Fresno, he served as the Pesticide Use Enforcement Division supervisor and has experience working as an inspector both on the east and the west side of Fresno County. Good afternoon. How are we today? Great. Great. My name is Bill Griffin. I'm with the uh, Madera County Ag Commissioner's Office. Uh, thank you, Director Lee, uh, Paul Verkey, uh, putting this on today. Um, I'm here to talk about everything that we do with the uh, Ag Commissioner system. Uh, it's quite extensive. I will definitely be covering pesticides, but I want to give everybody some experience on all the programs that, that the Ag Commissioner is involved in. Uh, this first slide is real quick. Uh, that is Brinder Paul Singh. He is our uh, one of our ag inspectors. He actually farms as well. He has uh, grapes and almonds, and he was kind enough to work with us on our environmental justice uh, presentation we did last year, um, giving a demonstration actually in the field showing what he does when he's not working for Fresno County. He, uh, he farms and uh, everything that goes with that. So he did a great job to help us out with that. Once again, my name is Bill. Um, I currently work for Madera County. I spent 18 years with Fresno County. Um, I was able to move closer to my actual home by working for Madera. So now I get to work with uh, Commissioner St uh, Stevie, and it, it's been a great arrangement and looking forward to uh, a long time working in that department. Um, this is when we were out working with that environmental justice group. Uh, showing them some personal protective equipment and all the things that go along with people who make applications and uh, field workers and all their responsibilities that go with that. So just a little bit of background about the state and the commissioner program. Um, there are obviously 58 counties in California. Each county has a commissioner and a sealer. Uh, 57 of those 58 that Ag Commissioner Sealer is the same person. So uh, one person acts as both roles. Um, the only one that's still a holdout is Ventura. Ventura does, uh, has a separate sealer for all their weights and measures activities, and then they have an Ag Commissioner for all their Ag activities. Um, there are three sets of counties, Pluma, Sierra, Inyo Mono, and Alpine, El Dorado, that one Commissioner Sealer covers both counties. So those six counties actually make up three sealer uh, commissioners. Um, and then there's an organization, the professional organization for the Ag Commissioners and Sealers is CACASA, or California Ag Commissioner and Sealer Association, CACASA for short. That is a, the group organization that works with DPR, CDFA, all together to um, facilitate all the things we do. So there's just a quick breakout of the different area groups so it's so that we can kind of, everybody kind of works together in smaller groups. You have the uh, northern region, Sacramento, coastal, Central Valley, and then the southern region. Because if everybody tried to get all together at the same time, it'd be very difficult. So they break them into these area groups so that they can work together in smaller areas. And usually those are similar type counties, similar type agriculture, or you know, similar type issues. So uh, I'm involved, obviously, in the San Joaquin area group, which is in the middle from Stanislaus County, or San Joaquin County, sorry, all the way down to Kern County. Um, so we have area group meetings with the commissioners, the sealers, and then also our deputies have area group meetings that we get together and, and discuss what's going on in our areas. So from my time in Fresno County, I'm going to reference that because they basically do everything. Um, if there's a program, they're probably involved with it. And so I want to kind of go through the numbers of all the things that we do and Fresno County does and all commissioners would have, could potentially be involved in. But just to give you an idea when you're dealing with Fresno County, um, to be an Ag Standard Specialist or inspector, you need a four-year degree, uh, usually in biology, botany, some kind of earth science, life science. Um, but we also have people who get into ag business. Um, we have some business degrees that have qualified to be inspectors um, in the Ag Commissioner system. 
So we take a v wide variety of people to do what we do. Um, that's why I brought up Brinder at the beginning. He's a grower. He has a degree in biology or a degree in uh, farming, um, but he's also a grower. So he brings that experience with him when he do goes in to do his regulatory activities, and it's very valuable to us. Um, so it works out really, really well. We have eight state licenses that we must pass and achieve in our time is when we, to advance in the Ag Commissioner system. Um, five of them are ag-related, three of them are weights and measures. Um, basically, the, how you pass those exams and, uh, and achieve those exams is how you move up through the system. Uh, most people start as an Ag Standard Specialist 1, and then as you accumulate licenses, you move up into 2, 3. Some are called 4s, uh, some are called uh, supervisors. It's different terminology, but the same idea. Um, Fresno County currently has about 95 staff members, which for an Ag Commissioner system is pretty darn big. Um, in comparison, Madera County has 15. So, you know, it's a big difference in staff. We still have a lot of things to accomplish with both staffs, but we'll see why here, what the difference is in just in the geographical size. Um, we said Fresno County sends things to 96 different counties when they do exports. We export to 96 different county, uh, countries, sorry, countries uh, for our export programs. Exporting 166 different commodities a lot of different things. You know, I, some of these numbers amazed me when I saw them. I didn't realize there was that many different kinds of fruits and vegetables and things that we send all over the world. Um, in the pesticide program, Fresno County has about 3,000 pesticide permits. Um, in comparison, Madera County has about 1,000. So it's about a third the size. It's still a lot of work. Uh, 20,600 or so export certificates, phytosanitary export certificates that help those 166 different commodities go all over the world. 325,000 lines of pesticide use reporting. California has the most comprehensive and best pesticide use reporting system anywhere in the world, in my opinion. And they, that is a reflection of how much information we deal with on a yearly basis, 325 lines, individual lines of, of data that comes in. So we get a lot of information. So what are some of the programs that the Ag Commissioner is responsible for? Crop reporting, we put out a crop report. Every Ag Commissioner is required to put out a crop report reflecting what their uh, Ag situation is in their county, uh, what they do, whether it's uh, nurseries, food, uh, fruit exports, whatever they do um, that creates a value for their, their uh, crop production. Pesticides, obviously, PUE, pesticide use enforcement, major part of what we do. Quarantine or export certification, we work on uh, sending commodities from California to other countries. Uh, pest exclusion, we want to keep the bad things out. Don't pack a pest is something that some of you guys may have heard of in the past. Uh, we work really hard to keep any of the bad bugs out. Uh, Asian citrus psyllid is a big one we're working on right now to try and keep uh, citrus greening out of the California citrus industry. Uh, that could, it pretty much wiped out Florida for a while, so was, we're trying to keep it out of, out of our state. Fruit and vegetable standards. When you go buy a cantaloupe or you go buy a, set, a, a head of lettuce, there are standards that those fruits and vegetables must meat. Um, there should be a certain sugar percentage, a certain color. Um, so we, we work on all those programs to make sure that they are acceptable when you purchase them because you purchase some of the best fruits and vegetables in the world from the state of California. Nursery products, when you buy your plants at your Home Depots or your Lowe's or those kind of places, uh, we make sure that they are quality. They're not infested with unwanted bugs, pests, or weeds. Um, and then we also have nurseries that sell to commercial growers, so we make sure those are clean and not spreading anything around uh, within the state. Eggs, shell eggs, chickens are our main one, um, making sure that the egg program is, uh, when you get buy eggs at the store, they're not going to have anything bad in them, they're not going to be too old, any of those kind of things, defects, we make sure that those are good things. Apiary, bees, work a lot, that's a hot topic right now, are bees. Uh, Ag Commissioner is very involved with the bee industry and apiary.
and then finally seed. And we'll go about all of these real quickly. So some quick crop report information. 2015 is the most recent data. They don't have the, the 16 crop report quite yet. Currently, for 2015, $6.6 billion for Fresno County. That's a huge chunk of money. 400 commodities produced in the county of Fresno. The entire county is about 3.8 million acres. Of that, we farm about 1.9 million. 50% of Fresno County is, is farmed. That's amazing. In my opinion, that's amazing. That's a huge half of all the land in the county of Fresno is farmed. In comparison, Madera County, smaller county physically, but $2.01 billion in production for 2015. 1.36 million acres for the whole county, 700,000 acres are farmed or harvested. Again, 51% of the county is currently farmed for production agriculture. So even though Madera is a little bit smaller, the numbers are, are very similar. 6.6, um, 2, 2 billion, almost $8 billion in production in two counties in the state, impressive. The uh, County of Fresno and agriculture in general never stops. And this is just a quick display of all the things that happen during the entire year. Um, it's extensive and I'm not gonna go through everything, but just to kind of show you, January through December, something's happening in the County of Fresno and just about any county that has ag production, but Fresno in particular has a lot of things happening all at one time. So, you know, January, February, March, you know, you've got your cold season fruits and vegetables, oranges, broccoli, that kind of thing. And then you get into April, March, April, the lettuce, and you start, so you just see how the production jumps up as you go. So it's an incredible amount of work, incredible amount of things being done in our, in Fresno County. And so it's just a, just an idea of how much happens. We'll get into pesticides here a little bit. There's some personal protective equipment. These are the things that we work with on a daily basis with applicators to make sure that they're using what they're needing in order to stay safe. Uh, we work with growers, we work with professional applicators. We wanna make sure that they're able to decontaminate themselves, to keep themselves safe, uh, so they're not bringing anything home to their families or contaminating anyone else in addition to themselves. So that's one another program we work with, and we'll talk a little bit more about PUE as we go. Quarantine, um, that's part of, working with exported uh, products. Raisins are a huge one for Fresno County. Uh, almonds are the one that's taken over. Um, they've really moved in. We've seen a tremendous increase in almond production and exports. Uh, peaches and then citrus. Those are probably the top four as, as far as production goes in the county. Um, major amount of our time is spent with those uh, commodities specifically, but there are, like I say, 166 different ones that we work with. Standards, like I say, we talk about you go to the store and you buy a head of lettuce. We have inspectors that work with our lettuce crews in the Huron area, which is where our production are, is for Fresno County. And we check lettuce to make sure that it is to standards. Uh, make sure it's the right size. If you opened up a box of that, you know, that's supposed to be, let's see, five, 10, 15, 30 heads. If you open that up and there was a bunch of loose space in there, you're not getting 30 heads, you're getting a lot of smaller ones, they may overpack it, they may do all kinds of things depending on what price is. We make sure that that's not happening, we want a standardization so that when the store offers you that head of lettuce for the price, you're getting what you paid for. Citrus, same thing. Grapes, if you ever bought table grapes, we want those grapes to have a certain sugar to acid ratio so that they, when you buy those, you know you're buying a, a product that you wanna come back and buy again. We're protecting the marketplace. Uh, melons is another one. When you buy a cantaloupe or a honeydew, watermelon, there are certain standards that must be kept in place so that when you purchase those items, you know you're getting a, a quality product. Pest exclusion. So this is where we get into keeping things out of our county or determining where things are. Uh, sometimes you see these little panels, traps, these yellow panel traps. Um, they have a bunch of bugs stuck to them because all that's on them is glue, uh, basically, we check those traps periodically and see what's on them. 
And from time to time, you'll find things we don't want. And so we have a grid system set up so we know where those traps are. If we find something we don't like, we can then determine where it is and we can determine what our next action will be, whether we are gonna treat for it, whether we need to look for more of them, what our next step is gonna be. So again, there's another type of trap, a trifold trap, and then a, a, McFar a McPhail trap. These are all specified to a certain type of pest. And so you can, we can determine you know, what we find in there, we're looking for something specific. But we see those traps all over the place all the time, especially now we're getting started with trapping. Eggs, once again, shell eggs. Uh, we check those for quality, uh, make sure we candle them, make sure that there's nothing in there other than, you know, there's no developing chicks or anything in there that shouldn't be uh, for quality's sake. So we check eggs and uh, make sure that those are up to standard. Nursery stock, again, large full-scale nurseries that we go in, make sure they're clean, make sure they're free of weeds, make sure they're free of pests, because nurseries are a great way to move things around. You know, if you have a nursery that has large amounts of monoculture, large amounts of the same type of plant, and then you move that, you know, that plant has a disease, and then you move it all over the state, even out of the state, it's a great way to move things around that you don't want to happen. So nurseries are a way we keep track of, make sure they're clean, make sure they're, they're what they need to be. They have their standards to maintain also. Apiary, bees, big thing right now. Um, lots of, of money going into bees right now, uh, fighting varroa mites and other issues, uh, colony collapse, a lot of research happening with bees. Uh, we work with beekeepers and applicators to make sure they get along and understand each other's needs. So we work in the apiary a lot. Been a very big subject over the years. High risk, this is something a little bit newer, um, but we, invent, we monitor pathways for invested, uh, invasive species, uh, looking for critters that are coming into our counties and checking to make sure there's nothing sneaking in. Uh, one of the ways we look for it is through airports, uh, the mail system, people send things from other parts of the country. Uh, one of the things we find a lot of oranges, uh, people have backyard oranges, and they want to share them with their family and friends in other parts of the country. So they pull them off their tree, they put them in a box, they send them across the country, filled full of all kinds of pests that they don't want. They're not doing it intentionally, they're just trying to be nice. But you open up a box and all of a sudden you've got pests that maybe we never had here before, and it was just sent in an airplane across the country and now it's in our state. So we work to try and intercept those kinds of things. Uh, we check UPS. Federal Express, all the overnight shippers, um, nursery stock from Home Depot, Lowe's, et cetera. They bring in nursery stock from all over the United States. Uh, we also check beehives. This was kind of one that kind of surprised me. When people bring in the bees for uh, almond pollination, well, those bees were on the ground in another part of the country. Sometimes critters such as fire ants like to build their nests on those pallets that those beehives are sitting on. They pick up those pallets, they put it on a truck, ship it 2,000 miles across the country, and put them down in our county, Fresno, wherever, and all of a sudden now we've got a new pest. So we check those. And then finally, what accomplishes a lot of this and really helps us out is our dog teams. Uh, so Fresno Yosemite Airport, we have staff that can go out there. Again, FedEx, DHL, UPS, those kind of things. We check those and see what they're doing. Our retail nursery inspections, we will go in and look at nursery stock that comes in from other parts of the state or other parts of the country and make sure that they are clean. There's a uh, bee truck dropping off some beehives. As you can see, they move a lot of pallets and a lot of bees uh, all at one time, put them in a new part of the state. If there's anything infecting or, or hitching a ride on that truck, now it's in our part of the state. So these guys help us out quite a bit. Uh, we've got our uh, Beagle that used to work for us, he's uh, in Fresno County. Uh, she's no longer, she's been retired. Um, the one in the middle is Soya. That is a dog that came to us from Georgia. She was actually a rescue animal that they pulled out of a, uh, uh, that was rescued off the street or as a stray and was trained to do, look for stuff on the belts. Um, they can hit on things that we would never even think of. Uh, they walk down the belts, and you can see the dog on the right-hand side there. 
Um, they will signal by scratching at the box, and they can tell, they can pick up scents far better than we ever could. And so they do a wonderful job at finding things in the mail. So if you're thinking about sending anything through the mail, we got things in there to try and intercept those. And you'd be surprised what we find. And then seed. Seed is another thing. This is a, an inspector doing a uh, thief sample off of a bag of seed. Um, as you can see, it says Australia on the bag. So we're checking it for, for uh, quarantine. So we're going to make sure there's no weed pests in it. We're also going to check it that it has a label on it. And the label, as far as testing, uh, germination, all those kind of things are accurate. Uh, sometimes people put labels on their seed, the seed shows up, and it's not what it says it should be. So uh, we check all those things to make sure there's nothing in there that we don't want. Kind of shifting gears a little bit into the sealer program. Some of it's, This is kind of one of those behind-the-scenes type programs. Nobody really realizes that we're there until you need us. Um, so the sealer program deals with all lots of weights and measures. That's our main focus. Uh, we also deal in scales. So when you purchase something on a scale that's weighed and you're charged by weight, that's what we check sure, make sure that weight is accurate. Taxi, if you jump in a taxi and you go a distance and they charge you for that distance, we make sure that that meter is correct. You're paying what you, the distance that you were taken. Fuel pumps, you buy fuel, gas, diesel, whatever. When you buy $100 worth of gas, you want to make sure you got $100 worth of gas. Uh, electric meters on your home or any other source where electric meters, or you're charged for the use of that electricity, we make sure those are accurate and reading properly. Uh, gas meters, meaning more like the gas meters on your home. Uh, if you're charged for propane or natural gas, make sure those are accurate. And then packaging and labeling, we also look at those things to make sure when you buy a 12 ounce bag of something, it's got 12 ounces of product in it. So the weights and measures, there's an example of a seal. That's where the whole name for sealer is. We actually put a seal on our devices to make sure that we inspected them. It tells you what year they were inspected, what county they're in, what commissioner is involved. And the, usually they will put an actual date and initials of the actual inspector who came in and looked at it. There's a guy with a one gallon prover. He's checking those glacier water dispensers. Make sure that that thing gives a gallon of water when it says it's giving you a gallon of water. Counter scales, when you buy stuff at the grocery store, we check those meter, those scales. You put a, you know, you're charged 50 cents a pound for bananas. They put bananas on there. You should be getting 50, 50 cents per pound. So you buy four pounds, $2. You would think it'd be simple, but sometimes it's not. Meat, meat's expensive. Here we go, you've got, you know, he's putting it up on the scale there. You wanna make sure that it shows the price per pound, how many pounds you're buying, and what the actual calculation is. So you're getting what you pay for. That's where you can see the seal on the outside of the scale there. That is exactly what that's for, is to show that it's been inspected. If you see a, a scale that doesn't have the seal on it, uh, you should be questioning what's going on, or at least asking about it. Taxi meters, same thing. All the taxi meters, uh, ta they bring in their taxis. We have a route that's laid out, a one-mile route. We have them drive the vehicle. We go with them. They drive the route. It comes back, and we know if it should be one mile. If it's reading more or less, we want to let them know that that meter is not, being, is not accurate. So we want to make sure when you pay your fare that you're paying the right amount. Again, here's the meters, electric meters, gas meters. Um, when the PG&E switched over to the smart meters a couple years back, we had a lot of people that were upset because they said their prices went up. It wasn't really so much always that their price, their costs went up, it's that their meter was bad. So they were paying for years, paying $25 a month, and all of a sudden now they got a new meter and they're blaming, well, they're trying to cheat me because now I got to pay $50 a month. Well, you actually weren't paying your total amount that you should have been because your meter was bad. So that's where a lot of those complaints are. So we take those meters, we can check them, make sure that they're accurate, that they're reading correctly, and uh, put them back in service if, they're, if everything passes. Gas meters, same thing. These things do wear out. You know, people don't think there's a whole lot involved in them, but they do have things that wear out. 
So they should be replaced periodically or checked. Gas pumps, we get a lot of complaints on gas meters. Uh, this gentleman here has got a meter uh, a prover, we call it, that it proves properly. He puts five gallons, if it's a five gallon prover, he puts five gallons of gas in it, it should reflect five gallons of gas. Uh, so he has a, 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 set, a system set up so he can do that. So you wanna make sure that you see the seals that are displayed on the front of the gas meter there. Those should always be there also. So if you go to a gas station and those meters are missing, you might wanna ask about it. Or, you know, where's your, where's your sealer? How come you're not, your, your pumps aren't sealed? So that's something to indicate that those, those uh, pumps have been done accurately. So here's just a quick example. Um, we wanna make sure that when people say they mark something down, they mark it down accurately. Uh, as you can see, it says it was $8, and now it's a dollar off, save a dollar, but it says $7.50. So it's not an accurate display. We would want to make sure that that is changed. So if you see undis you know, displayed things that aren't accurate, bring it up to your store's attention that, hey, that, that sign's not accurate. Uh, and if you see it commonly and you have, think you've been cheated, you can let your ad commissioner sealer know, and they will go out and do an investigation. The County Department of Agricultural's mission. So I kind of stole this from Fresno County, but I think it really applies to just about every county. Um, we are committed through the Ag Commissioner system and inspectors to promoting California agriculture. We want California. My, ag, my job depends on ag. If you ever heard that, it's true. My job does depend on ag. Um, Protecting environmental quality through sound application of pesticide and worker safety regulations. We want to make sure that people that apply pesticides do them safely and effectively. We don't want to just spray to spray. We want to spray to actually take care of the problem and do it accurately. Fostering public comment uh, confidence by assuring a fair and equitable marketplace. We want to make sure everyone has their right to do what they do and do it uh, properly. Don't cheat the system. Preserving ag land for future generations. Once again, we want to make sure that our ag land stays around so we can keep using it. We don't want to abuse it, poison it, anything like that. Minimize the pest risk pathways of exotic and harmful pests. So again, we don't want things coming here that we don't want. We want to keep them, they can keep them. We'll come visit them if they'd like, but we don't want them here. Minimize uh, the uh, crop value, again, $6.6 .6 billion. That's just Fresno County. $2 billion, Madera County. A lot is at stake, a lot of, a lot of jobs and a lot of people's uh, well-being depends on those things. 400 commodities for the county of Fresno. We supply food, feed, and fiber products to over 97 countries. And that, that number is growing. Uh, more and more industrialized countries come into play. They want what we have because we, we have the best food supply in the world out of California, and they all want some of it, which is a good thing. Here's just kind of a quick example of uh, our crop list for Fresno. Um, almonds, 1.2 billion just on their own. And this is from 2015. So this data is almost two years old. That number has gone up. Uh, but that was the number one crop for 2015. If you look about 10 years before, actually 20 years, 95, two, yeah, about 20 years, it was the seventh biggest crop. And in over 20 years, it's gone to number one. Grapes, grapes has always been one or two. In Madera County, it's the same way. Uh, nearly a billion dollars, $900 million in, in production for 2015. Uh, poultry, cattle, tomatoes, uh, dairy. Now, some counties do a lot better than dairy than Fresno and Madera. Uh, Tulare, that's a major player. That's their number two, one or two uh, commodity at times. Uh, milk production is a huge part of Tulare County. So there's a variability in counties. Not all of us grow peaches or plums or whatever you want to call it. We have strong points. Different counties do different things. Uh, peaches, we're a big one, 15. Garlic. And then the, the one kind of up-and-comer, mandarins, cuties. Big, big market jump. Um, they weren't even on the radar 20 years ago. Now they're number nine and growing. They're actually separate from oranges. Um, they have their own category because they've been growing so extensively. Actually, oranges like your navels and valentias have dropped a bit because the mandarin production has increased. So it's, it's, a, it's definitely an increasing market share. 
Here's just a quick map showing how big Fresno County is. Um, as you can see, we have seven different areas kind of colored out there. Just to show you how massive that the county is and where our production sites are, um, it still continues even further up into the mountains, but this is basically our production area, which goes all the way from the other side of I-5, Interstate 5, uh, all the way up into Sanger, uh, Reedley area, which is basically to the mountains. So well, from one mountain range to the other, from the Diablo mountain range to the west, to the Sierra mountain range to the east, production over the entire county. Massive, massive amount of production. Farming is a major part of it. That's why we have our districts. Fresno County has districts. Um, there's seven of them because there's no way we could do all this from one office. So we actually had offices in each one of those uh, colored sections. Firebaugh, Huron, Kerman, Selma, Sanger, our Fresno office, and then Reedley. So we just kind of take the big city that's in those areas just to help spread the wealth a little bit because it's a massive amount of area. As you can see, it's a large area to patrol. It's a large area to keep track of. We have seven different districts that help take care of that. Three to six standards inspectors, uh, ag standards inspectors per district. Uh, that's why the staff is so large for Fresno County. And they do multiple things, as you've seen. We do quarantine, pesticides, fruit and vegetable standards, and we also do our investigations, which is kind of part of the pesticide program. Uh, we go out and investigate not just pesticides, but any kind of complaint. Uh, we investigate noise complaints, smell complaints, odor complaints, that kind of thing. So it's, we do a lot of different things. So just to kind of cover it in case you didn't know, uh, pesticides are kind of an umbrella term. It includes many kinds of chemicals and substances, both natural and synthetic. Uh, pesticides, any substance in intended to control, destroy, repeal, repel, or attract a pest. Um, so sometimes people think when they say pesticide, they just kind of automatically think insecticides. Um, that's always the biggest response I get is when they say, when I say pesticide, they're thinking raid or something like that. Um, it covers a blanket of things, insecticides, herbicides. Um, I actually have had people say, I say herbicide like Roundup, something like that. And they're like, that's a pesticide? It's like, well, yeah, it mitigates a pest. So. Uh, lots of different things, insecticides, herbicides, rodenticides, lots of different things covered in this topic. So uh, just to kind of throw that definition out there. So just some examples, Roundup, herbicide, Velocicide, snail killer. Um, a lot of people don't think of that as a pesticide, but it kills snails. So it's a pesticide. Insecticides. Raid is a common one. Everybody's kind of seen that at one point or another in their, in their time. They've seen Raid or some kind of insecticide used in their home. How many thought chlorine was an insecticide or pesticide? Yeah, you guys do because we're talking to the, it's preaching to the choir here. But I have a, that's probably our number one complaint. Our investigation that we do is doing chlorine bleach calls. Uh, people go to the hospital because they spilled or splashed some bleach in their eyes. And so we get that anytime somebody goes to a doctor for any kind of pesticide illness, we have to go out and respond to it and check on it and see what we can do to prevent that from happening again. And so bleach is our probably number one thing that we go out and check. I do these presentations for lots of different types of people, and that one always gets the, huh? So... Um, this is kind of a regulatory flow chart. Like I say, this, this room probably knows this, but I have to show you everybody kind of what we're talking about. Uh, EPA is the parent, DPR, and then County Ag Commissioners. County Ag Commissioners, the boots on the ground. Um, just to kind of show you what uh, EPA, or Region 9, which is our area, Department of Pesticide Regulation, and CACASA, which represents the Ag Commissioners, have a cooperative agreement. We basically, to ensure a unified and coordinated, so we're working together, program of pesticide reporting, investigation, and enforcement. So we all three work together to accomplish that goal. And we do a pretty good job of it. The Ag Commissioner system, in case you weren't familiar, has, like I said, a commissioner. All 58 counties have a commissioner. 
Uh, there's sometimes an assistant commissioner. That's somebody who works alongside, takes care of a lot of the things at home. The ag commissioners tend to do a lot of work outside their county. So an ag com assistant commissioner usually will work inside, uh, kind of keeps everything in-house running smoothly. Um, then below the commissioner, ag commissioner assistant, then the ag deputies. Um, their deputies are the next level down in management, and they are the ones who often work directly with their uh, inspectors um, on investigations and that kind of thing, working on training, making sure that all their inspectors uh, know their job and their duty and take care of it. Investigators, those are the boots on the ground people. Um, actually, investigator, Fresno County was is uh, lucky enough that they actually have investigators. Um, they're a separate specialized inspector, um, and they help take care of a lot of the problems with doing uh, notice to propose actions, uh, civil penalties, decision reports, that kind of thing. Between the deputy investigator and then the last is the inspectors. Those are the ones you will see in the fields doing the inspections. Uh, licensing, that's a big part of what we do too and we follow up on. Uh, all commercial agriculture licensing is issued by the Department of Pesticide Regulation. Farm labor contractor licensing is issued by the Department of Industrial Relations, DIR. Structural is through the Structural Pest Control Board. And county commercial licenses must be valid at the time that they register. So everyone who does pesticide, pesticide use, sorry, does pesticide for hire, they must be licensed, they must have a pest control business license, and they must register with the counties in which they will do work. And in order to do that, before they register with our county, they must have their valid licenses in place. Uh, the commercial licensing that are issued by DPR, those are your pilots, your QALs, Qualified Applicator License, Qualified Applicator Certificates, UACs, um, Pest Control Advisors, that kind of thing. We'll talk about those in just a minute. We register all pest control businesses, not only ag, but structural, so when they get, before they start working in our county, they come to our county and they register. Uh, sometimes that is a, a registration fee um, to our county, um, and then, then they can begin work. Uh, farm labor contractors register with us, pest control advisors, and pilots, ag pilots. Those are all required before they start work in our county. Pesticide use permits, two type of permits that we require for production agriculture or even non-ag. Anytime that somebody wants to purchase materials that they will be using in ag or even non-production ag settings or even non-ag um, must have a permit. Um, there's two types. There's an operator ID. That's for all non-California restricted materials. Uh, before buying or using pesticides in production ag, every operator is required to obtain a unique operator ID for each county in which the pesticides are used. So if you have county people who work in multiple counties, they have multiple permits. And it's a lot of work to keep all those permits straight and all those applications straight. If you want to use a restricted material, a California restricted material is a material that's designated by the director as restricted in the state. You must have a permit for ag or non-ag use of restricted material and shall be issued in the name of the operator of the property to be treated. Those must be in place before they do commercial agriculture. Pest control advisors, we call them PCAs for short. They have a PCA license. Each license has multiple categories. Uh, a PCA can cover a lot of different uh, obligations, specialties, uh, whether it's weeds, aquatic, Commercial ag, non-ag, vertebrate, there's all kinds of different categories that they have to be licensed in um, if, before they do work in those areas. They do have to register with our county before they start anything. Uh, and they have to put anything they do what they call a recommendation. So you go to a pest control advisor and say, I grow peaches and I've got a pest in my peaches, what can I do to take care of that pest? Your PCA will say, okay, here's what I think will take care of that pest and they put it in writing. They can't just say, here, go do this, buy this product from my company and go spray it. They have to put it in writing so it's specific to how much they use, how often, uh, what timing, that kind of thing. 
So it's, it's critical that that information is relayed to the grower, the applicator, in a way that they can rely on and know that they're doing the right thing. So they have to put everything in writing. They work with growers, applicators, and suppliers. They are kind of the middleman between this whole system. And they're really an essential part of the, what I call the production and compliance puzzle. You have us who are looking to, meaning the ag commissioners, to make sure everything's doing things right. You have the growers who are trying to do everything right. And you have the PCA in the middle who's making these recommendations. We work with all three of us work together to make sure we're all in compliance. And PCAs work as a real good communicator between us and their clients. Use reporting, I talked about those 325,000 use reports. Production agriculture, the pro operator property which is producing an ag commodity shall report the use of pesticides applied to a crop, commodity, or site to the county in which it was produced. So you have a production agricultural report. Everything that's used on that crop in order to produce that crop is reported to the ag commissioner system. We also have a monthly summary. Those are done by the uh, non-production guys, such as structural, um, your structural applicators, your, your uh, spider and cockroach applicator. They turn in everything they do. Now, their stuff isn't done specific to a, to a site, uh, but they do tell us what they used over a specific month. So all applications that are done commercially in California are reported. Here's some industry partners, obviously growers. They're top of the chain. Pest control businesses, not only ag, but structural and non-ag. Well, so what would be an example of non-ag? Non-ag would be your uh, commodity fumigators. Um, a lot of your structural applicators are non-ag, that kind of thing. So it's not in the production of an ag commodity. Your pest control pesticide dealers or suppliers. Farm labor contractors, those guys that go out there and, you know, weed, make applications, do what they do and then harvesting, obviously, and then pest control advisors are also part of that list of people we work with on a daily basis. Here's some community partners. These are people that are not necessarily in the ag business, but they work with us, they work with you uh, in DPR, because um, they're concerned about their environment and their, their neighborhoods. Um, we have Ivan groups, which are identifying violations affecting neighborhoods. Uh, a couple of those types of groups. Fresno, we had the FERN group, the Federal, I'm sorry, Fresno Environmental Reporting Network. Um, those groups work with uh, their community and they raise concerns or complaints and they bring them to us and we work with them to try and resolve them. Kern, uh, Kern, Ag, Kern County has the same entity, but they call themselves Keen, uh, Kern Environmental Enforcement Network. Uh, there's non-governmental organizations. Those are organizations that are not government related, but do similar type activities where they work with uh, local organizations, not necessarily pesticide related, but other issues as well. But they can be part of that community. Uh, obviously, you have community representatives, commodity groups, uh, your peach boards, your almond boards, your raisin boards, those guys. And then uh, training and education partners, uh, UC Extension might be an example of that. Uh, those are all people that we all work with, and they're part of our team. Inspections, this is what we spend a lot of time doing. We're an essential part of an element of the county's pesticide use enforcement program. We go out and make sure that people are doing what they're doing, uh, doing it properly. Uh, inspections ensure the safety of handlers, field workers, the public, and the environment. We have lots of things to keep into consideration when we do an inspection. Inspections are conducted for the purpose of assessing and documenting whether a pesticide use activity complies with all laws and regulations. County Ag Commissioner staff perform use monitoring at headquarters. So use monitoring is somebody's making an application to a crop. And we want to go out and make sure that when they make that application, they're doing it properly, safely, protect the environment and their workers and we want to make sure they're staying in compliance. Ground applications, air applications, airplanes, helicopters. We do structural fumigations, where our commodity fumigations is, we do the circus tents, I call them, because they're big, colorful tents they put on houses to, for termites or bed bugs, which has been the popular one lately. 
uh, field worker inspections, making sure they have their decontamination so they keep themselves safe and as well as the food supply. Here's a list of all the types of different investigations the county will do. Drifts, where materials move off site. Crop injury, something gets damaged that wasn't meant to be. Field worker injuries, complaints from odor or noise, uh, which are not necessarily pesticide related, but we do look into them and we try and resolve them. Uh, reports of loss or non-performance, something didn't work like you said it was going to, uh, or someone got damaged crop. Illness reports, doctor's reports, where someone goes to a doctor and says, I got injured making this application, and we follow up and find out what happened and how we can prevent it. Or residues, we find a residue, DPR, Department of Pesticide Regulation, does a, a sampling of commodities and finds that something was applied that shouldn't have been. We follow up on that. What type of enforcement actions can we do? We will give them a notice of violation, which says you did something wrong, don't do it again. Here's what you did, and here's how we fix it. Warning letter, very similar. Tell somebody something ain't right, we need to get it fixed. Uh, and then we also have the ability to do what's called a NOPA, or Notice of Proposed Action, where we do a fine, or we can limit their permit. We make it so they have to renew their permit more often, uh, we put limitations on where they can make applications if we can do it. And uh, as part of all of this and part of what we call due process, everything has the ability to be appealed. So the, the grower applicator says, I didn't do that or I don't deserve this. They can appeal it back and we can work on it together and find out what we can do. Sometimes they're right. That's my presentation. 